Another way of doing this, which gets around having to develop a metamorphic buffer layer, is to actually grow the materials you want lattice matched to a different set of substrates, in this case, indium gallium phosphide, indium phosphide or gallium arsenide. You grow your materials lattice matched, and then you use a wafer bonding approach in which you can then bond the different junctions together, and then you can peel off one of the wafers, the wafer that's uh, sitting on top, and then you get your solar cell. Now, the problem with that is that um, the best architecture that people know about relies on using indium phosphide as your bottom substrate. Indium phosphide is very, very expensive. Wafer bonding is very, very tricky. This bonded interface tends to be high resistance. And so while there may be application of this kind of solar cell architecture in space, for CPV, where you're driving a large current through the solar cell, the resistance of this interface probably is not going to allow that to happen effectively for high performance. Uh, you'll also hear about quantum wells and quantum dots being implemented in solar cells. I'm really not a big fan of this technology, only because it seems to be a one technology node solution. So what's going on here, and you guys have probably studied quantum wells in your other classes. If you take, for example, gallium arsenide, you embed within the, uh, within the junction some indium gallium arsenide strain compensated quantum wells, you effectively extend the band gap. And this gives you your nice exciton peak, which is going to give you some extra absorption. That is effectively extending your absorption range and the current out of your cell. So this, if you are able to put quantum wells in your, your top cell and your middle cell, you can start to get better current matching with a germanium bottom junction. And so people are doing this. There's a company in Europe called Azure that is now coming out with a 42% commercially qualified technology using quantum wells in the top and middle part of the, their solar cell. However, when you look at driving efficiencies to 50%, there's really nowhere to go. There's really not a very good application of this technology elsewhere. So um, it can be done. Uh, you'll, you will see it in the industry probably for the next three to five years, but really going beyond um, probably 42 or 43 percent, you're not going to see that. The same exact story is true for quantum dots. Okay, I'm running out of time here, but I just want to end with what we do at Solar Junction and what the future looks like. So, what um, we started in Coach's group, I think back in 1997 or something thereabouts, is we started to work on a set of compound semiconductors called dilute nitride. So, this stuff is really interesting. So if you look at gallium, uh, gallium nitride, which has a very high band gap, totally different crystal structure. It's a hexagonal crystal structure, very small lattice constant, and gallium arsenide. If you add nitrogen to gallium arsenide and you said, what, do, what would I think the band gap to do? You would say, well, the band gap goes up. And so if you look at gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, draw a line through them. If I add a little bit of nitrogen, the band gap should go up. That's actually not the case. What happens is the band gap actually goes down and the lattice constant goes down. And this is remarkable. So, the lat so what happens is, and I'll, I'll explain the physics uh, at, at a high level in a moment, but what happens is you now have a material where you can drive the band gap down into the infrared while reducing its lattice constant. And what's really interesting is just like indium gallium arsenide, if you add indium and nitrogen in the right ratio, you can actually drive the band gap down into the infrared while keeping the lattice constant exactly the same. So you have four, you have like four, you have like three degrees of freedom: indium, gallium, and nitrogen. And because of that, you can independently control the band gap and the lattice constant. So you've kind of specified that perfectly. And what the Harris group has shown, and a lot of other groups is that a one to three ratio between uh, nitrogen and indium gives you lattice matching to gallium arsenide and, our, and or germanium. Now what's cool is if you look at this, if you use the dilute nitrites in conjunction with the other materials, indium aluminum gallium arsenide, indium aluminum gallium phosphide, you now have a suite of materials that are all lattice matched and can absorb a really big part of the solar spectrum. And this is what we're doing at Solar Junction. 
And I think it's a significantly easier approach to actually get the higher efficiency. So one of the real um, breakthroughs that we had in the Harris group is this material is very, very difficult to grow. And it turns out that growing it by MBE and adding antimony as a surfactant was a breakthrough that allowed this material to produce the quality that we needed it to be in order to be integrable into a multi-junction solar cell. So a lot of people have actually worked on this using MBE and MOCVD, and they could never get very good material quality. In fact, there's no other uh, company in the world that can grow it as well as Solar Junction and maybe the Harris Group here at Stanford. So um, this is really unique technology. It's not often where you have one company or a, or a group, a small group that can make a material. Now there's a lot of people competing with us. They're, they're trying to reverse engineering what we're doing. Uh, and maybe one day they'll, ca they'll, they'll catch up, but we have the lead right now. So just to kind of drive this home, everything is lattice matched. All the materials are gonna have the same atomic spacing. It's much, much easier to grow than the metamorphic structures that I talked about earlier. This is a TEM that um, I think Coleman had done back when he was in grad school. The TEMs are boring. They just look like, you know, shades of gray. That's how they're supposed to look. You don't want to see dislocations or anything in the material. It's boring, it's good, it's simple. This is what you want. And uh, this is why we've actually uh, been successful as quickly um, as we have been. So the way this works is um, there's been some different modeling of what happens when you add nitrogen into gallium arsenide. If you look at kind of perturbation theory, as you add nitrogen into gallium arsenide, you get mixing between the valence electrons of nitrogen and the gallium arsenide conduction band. That gives you a plus and a minus energy level. That minus energy level effectively reduces the band gap of your material. And one of the real challenges is as you add nitrogen into the material, you create some mid-gap mid um, defects and that has been a real challenge to control. With MOCVD, it doesn't work. MOCVD necessarily incorporates both carbon and hydrogen in the material, and that uh, forms complexes with, with nitrogen that creates defects that really reduces the performance of these junctions. Um, with the MBE process, which we started at Stanford and further developed at Solar Junction, you really um, avoid a lot of these effects. So I'll go through this quickly. So what we've done and what we've been focusing on as our first commercial product is a triple junction cell where we get rid of germanium, and we grow everything on a gallium arsenide substrate, and our bottom junction is our gallium indium nitride arsenide antimonide. We got a world record about um, two years ago at 43.5% um, at um, around 400 to 600 suns. This was independently verified at both um, NREL and Fraunhofer. We've actually optimized these for higher concentration and temperature. And then just about six months ago, we were able to get 44% out of 1,000 suns. Now, what's really interesting about this is this is the toolbox that we have in play here at Solar Junction. We're going to be moving all of our four, five, and six junction cells to, uh, on a germanium platform. We've shown broad tunability with the dilute nitride from about 0.8 electron volts all the way up to about 1.3 electron volts. Um, indium aluminum gallium arsenide is a well-known compound semiconductor. We've shown tunability with very good current drive and VOC from 1.4 electron volts about to about 1.7 electron volts. And then aluminum indium gallium phosphide, there's a lot of work to be done here, but we've shown tunability from 1.88 electron volts to over 2.1 electron volts with still pretty good material quality. And this is our technology roadmap. We think we can combine all of these materials together and actually get to above 50%. Um, actually, in the next three to five years, our competitors are going to try to do the same, but they don't have a very good roadmap. And in fact, they're using all sorts of different technologies to get to where they need to get to. One of the things, and I'll finish here in just a moment, is as, as you increase number of junctions in these materials, your spectral efficiency does decrease because one junction is going to be limiting throughout the day. As you go to four, five, and six junctions, you have more sensitivity to that. What the industry believes is you can go up to about a six-junction solar cell 
and still get significant benefits uh, in overall energy yield. So my last slide, um, where is industry going? We're moving from four inch wafers to six inch wafers to drive down the cost. You're gonna see three junction cells probably make it up to about 45% um, this year, next year. I think four junction cells are gonna start coming out in about a year. And then um, uh, we're actually gonna be developing four to six junction cells simultaneously. We're actually probably gonna maybe even think about skipping a technology node. And then I think one of the things that's unique about multi-junction solar cells is a focus more on energy harvesting rather than pure efficiency. So that's it. I think I finished with 15 seconds. Slides. <laughs> anyway, so you guys are going to get this slide deck. Feel free to contact me anytime.